So today's team is comprised of a scientist, Dr. Susan Lewis, and a communications specialist, which is Dr. Rebecca Imes. And the talk they'll be presenting is Parental Care, Cannibalism, and Mind Control in Microanimals, a musical choose-your-own science adventure story. Now let me tell you a little bit about these two. Susan Lewis is a professor of biology and animal behavior and the director of faculty development at Carroll University. She teaches a course in behavioral ecology that introduces students to behavioral research methods at the Milwaukee County Zoo. And as a side, that's actually how I got into doing research because as a freshman, I decided to do a, a project at the zoo, animal behavior project at the zoo. And that turned me on. I was going to be a vet, but that turned me on to becoming a biologist. She conducts research on parental care and social behavior of vertebrates, specifically on bats and invertebrates, which is on amphipods, which is what we're going to learn about today. She received her PhD in behavioral ecology and an MA in environmental education from the University of Minnesota and her BA was in biology from Earlham College. Rebecca Imes is an associate professor of communications at Carroll University, and she's also the chair of the Department of Communications and Sociology. She teaches in many areas of relational communication, including interpersonal, intercultural, and her specialty, health communication. Her recent research projects include communication in families surviving cancer, high-functioning interdisciplinary palliative care team um, communication, and communication between uh, physical therapy graduate students and their clinical patients. Rebecca also com consults with groups concerning communication environments and leadership skills, and with groups and individuals concerning issues with public speaking. In 2010, she was awarded Carroll University's Alheiser Award for Teaching Excellence. Rebecca received her PhD from the University of Iowa, her MA in Health Communication from Emerson College and Tufts University School of Medicine, and a BA in Communication from Nebraska Wellesleyan University. So sit back, relax, and please join me in welcoming Rebecca and Susan. Good morning. We thank you all for being here today. We were challenged to create a, something for a lay audience, but also something that would be unique. Although Sue and I come from dis different disciplines, we both take a keen interest in the research on teaching, and so we've included a few elements today that are supposedly helpful to audiences paying attention and remembering the information that they learn. So one of the things we're going to do is draw on something that hopefully some of you remember, perhaps from your childhood or teenage years. How many people read Choose Your Own Adventure Stories? Thank goodness, otherwise this would make very little sense. <laughs> so one of the things we are doing in today's presentation is there will be several decision points throughout Susan's presentation, at which point you will be asked as an audience to tell us which direction you would like us to take the presentation. There are limited choices, and we will follow one of those paths at that time. Uh, another thing we're doing is in, oh, oh yes, said, please. Is there anybody that yes. doesn't have a pack of three cards? We've got some. Yeah, we'll get you some more. Uh, so you'll have those and Sue will cue you for when you'll need to use those throughout the presentation. Another novel part that we are using is the, we're drawing on the science of research and teaching that shows that using music helps people to learn. And we know that from several different types of education. So we know that there are connections between the science and the music centers of your brain and how you learn. I'm sorry, the math and music centers of your brain for how you learn. That has been applied in having students listen to classical music and then take exams to see if they do any better with if they listen to classical music while they were studying. They do, but only if they also listen to the classic mu classical music while they're taking the exam, so that can be a little bit troublesome. Uh, we have some applications in high schools. There is an entire website devoted to musical physics songs taking regular songs that everybody knows and putting physics formulas into them and using those in high school classrooms. A middle school teacher in math did, uh, in his algebra class, wrapped all of his algebra equations and his students' test scores did go up. 
So, so there's something we can all learn rapping now. Uh, so today we will be using some songs we hope you will be familiar to you, some of 50s doo-wop, a little Kermit the Frog, a little Patsy Cline. We drew pretty widely here. Uh, so we bring all of those together to you today so that we hope that you will be able to uh, not only enjoy the presentation, but remember it as well. I want to make very clear, though, as you heard in Ellen's presentation, that I am a professor of communication, not a professor of vocal performance. So we're all clear? <laughs> All right, well, let's get started. Um, first of all, our first choice is in thinking about what kind of an animal you want to study. So we have animal A. It sleeps for 20 out of 24 hours a day. Um, it can also potentially kill you. Um, it's pretty rare, so in an area maybe a little bit bigger than the city of Waukesha, you'd probably find eight, 10 so of these animals. Um, which means that if you want to get any kind of a reasonable sample size, you're going to need to study a really large area. And you're going to need hundreds of thousands of dollars in grant money to be able to do this research. Animal B is active pretty much whenever you want it to be active. It's completely harmless. Um, in an area that's about this big, you can find 8 to 13 of the animals. Um, and it requires pretty much no funding to be able to work, so you're not going to have to spend half your time writing grants. So you have cards. This is also to practice using our fancy low-tech clicker system. Um, you get to pick a blue card if you want to study animal A and a red card if you want to study animal B. And we're pretty evenly split. Nobody's holding up a green card, so that's good. All right, if you want to study animal A, you get to go to Africa and study lions. If you want to study animal B, you get to study these adorable little creatures called amphipods. Um, when I went to graduate school, this wasn't quite the, the issue I faced, but my advisor and her husband both studied lions in Tanzania. They are the primary researchers on the Serengeti Lion Project. I went to the University of Minnesota because they are the primary research on the Serengeti Lion Project, and I thought that would be cool. I, wasn't probably going to do research on lions, but I was probably going to do research on mongooses in Africa with them, thought that would be great. And the whole time that we, me and my colleagues were there, um, they kept saying, study insects. And we kept going, you study lions. <laughs> <laughs> study insects, study insects. It's so much easier than studying lions. And I ended up studying bats for my PhD work, which wasn't quite insects, it was still mammals, still kind of cute and fuzzy. And then I came to Carroll and tried to start out doing that bat research there and found that it was not particularly easy to do, particularly when raising small children. Um, and then I started to learn more about amphipods and started to figure out that a lot of the questions that I wanted to ask in bats, I could ask in amphipods much more easily. And so that's where we ended up. So what is an amphipod? Throughout this, the presentation, you'll see this lovely rainbow-colored amphipod up at the top. Um, they are not that big. If you look at your fingernail and you don't chew your fingernails excessively or let them grow excessively, um, that white part at the top of your index finger is probably about the size of an amphipod. So if you are a little person and you look, then you're probably looking at the amphipod that is a little kid amphipod. And if you are a great big guy and you're looking and it's a pretty large amount of white there, that's about the size of a large male amphipod. Um, so that's about what I'm working on. So they're big enough to see, but they're not necessarily gigantic. Why are there so many studies about vertebrates? Why do humans love backbone so? Invertebrates are vital and capture imaginations. If only they didn't suffer from poor public relations. Invertebrates are spineless, but their intrigue is timeless. Why cannot more people see? In data collection, we'll find the invertebrate connection, the biologists, the environmentalists, and me. And the pods are pretty cool. Da 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 
I just have to stand here and talk. <laughs> I think that's great. Um, so, you know, in a really broad scale sense, amphipods are part of the circle of life and therefore are kind of a cool thing to study. Um, if you're much more particular and you want really a concrete reason why they're important and you fish, um, amphipods are a really important food, food source around here for trout. Um, and part of the aquatic ecosystem, part of the reason I study them is because out at Carroll's Field Station, they are by far the most common large invertebrate in the stream system out there. And so I can go out and in about half an hour, if it's not freezing cold, I can pick up 100 or so amphipods, bring them back to the lab, throw them in the refrigerator, they're entirely happy. Um, and then I work with them as, as time permits, basically. Um, to get that same number of bats in my PhD research, well, in two years of, of collecting data for my PhD work, I had 90 bats. So I can do in half an hour what I could do in two years out there. Um, I think if I wanted to study 90 lions, that would probably take an really large project. Um, and they're just kind of cool once you figure out a little bit more about them. So amphipods have been in the news a little bit lately if you're paying attention to geeky news anyway um, because they were pulling some amphipods up from deep sea vents. And so these are like the furthest places down in the ocean. And when you get that far down in the ocean, it turns out they're not the size of your fingernail. They are big whopping critters that you pull up. Um, that oddly enough have no internal muscular system at all, whereas the little ones do, but these gigantic things coming out of the deep sea vents don't. Um, there's a ton of diversity. There are amphipods that live in marine systems. There are amphipods that live in freshwater systems. Some of them are really cool blue and gold striped critters. Um, some of them are a little bit more plain. They're also, as I said before, really abundant. So this top picture over here is taken underneath the ice. So those are ice stalactites coming down. Um, but all of those little orangish spots around there are amphipods swimming around in the water. Um, so for a researcher who's curious, there's a whole lot of things that you can look at. From my perspective, one of the questions that interests me most is parental care. And they carry their eggs around in a pouch, just kind of like a kangaroo does. Um, so that gives me an opportunity to ask questions about parental care in a system that's really easy to work. Um, we'll touch on some other things later on, but where there may be human applications of some of the research that's being done on amphipods. Um, so there's just lots of good reasons to work on them. But that said, we need to figure out what question we want to talk about first. So um, we have three questions here. All of them are questions that I have done some level of research on. One is on mind controlling parasites. One is on why BPA free water bottles matter and why they might, why BPA might matter to amphipods. And why micro animals make good, or whether amp micro animals make good parasites and good parents, I mean, and whether they, you know, what about eating kids and cannibalism kinds of stuff. So if you like the first question, show me your red card. Second question, show me your blue card. Third question, show me your green card. We'll probably have time to get to more than one question. Looks like I'm thinking red. OK, mind controlling parasites. This is where we get to see if my fancy dancy technology works. Cool. All right. Um, so mind controlling parasites you might bring to mind some image sort of like this. Um, in amphipods, oops, don't hit that. In amphipods, mind-controlling parasites look something like this. So that lovely little yellow dot there, and maybe, yeah, right there, or the orange dot, um, is a parasite, and it is insisted in the amphipod. So it's stuck in the body cavity, and it'll stay there permanently until the amphipod dies. Um, the reason it does that, OK, I will learn eventually not to touch that button. Um, is because this parasite has a really complicated life cycle. So it spends most of its life in the body of a fish. And in the body of the fish, it will find a mate, and it will reproduce, and it'll produce lots and lots and lots of eggs. And those eggs come out in fish poop and end up in the stream somewhere. So they're down on the bottom of the stream now, a bunch of eggs. 
And the next step of the life cycle is that the amphipods find those eggs and eat them. And that brings the parasite into the body of the amphipod where they mature and develop into that little orange cyst that we saw before. And then they have to get their way back into the fish because that's the only place where they're gonna be able to mate and have babies and lay eggs and do all of that kind of stuff. So that's the tricky part. Almost did it again. Um, if you were an amphipod and you wanted to get from the amphipod into the body of a fish, would you rather A, ask nicely, B, leave it up to random chance, or C, ruthlessly control the amphipod's behavior to make them more likely to get eaten by that fish? All right, you are smart parasites. Okay. In order to think about that, we have to think about how amphipods avoid getting eaten. So, if you were an amphipod and you were in a stream and you don't have a parasite, so you don't want to get eaten, what are some of the things you might do? And so that was kind of the question that we wanted to figure out. Do amphipods get safety in numbers? Because if they do, then that might be something that the parasites could manipulate. But first we had to figure out if they do. Um, and so we set up a little experiment and we put amphipods into little glass Christmas balls. So the clear glass ones where they're that's all you're gonna see. And we put some sand in the Christmas balls, we buried the Christmas balls down in the sand in an aquarium, and then we put a fish in. And we gave that fish the opportunity to swim around and if it were interested, to try and prey on the amphipods, but the amphipods are in the little Christmas balls and so they're protected. Um, when we did that, this is kind of a weird graph and we'll come to you in a second. Um, if you're up above the zero line in the graph, it means the fish was trying to attack the amphipods that were by themselves in the Christmas ball. And if you're down below the line, it means that the, the fish was trying to attack the amphipods that were in a group more. And so all of this little bar brown bar that's in there, since it's up on the positive side, it means most of the time the fish was attacking the glass ball with the single amphipod in it more often than it was attacking the Christmas ball with the whole group of amphipods in it. Suggesting that, yes, there is safety in numbers. Musical interlude. This one brought to you by the recent Christmas season. Oh, Christmas ball, oh, Christmas ball, how many of the pods how we see? Christmas ball, oh, Christmas ball, how many of the pods how if there be one, or there be ten, the fish will strike again and again. And as statistics taught to you, the many will outlast the few. So from a research perspective, before we could start asking questions about whether the parasite messed them up, we needed to figure out what kinds of things might be effective in messing them up. Um, so once we knew, yep, there is safety in numbers, then we wanted to see if parasitized amphipods responded to that in ways that were the same as or different from unparasitized amphipods. So continuing with our use of repurposing various pieces of equipment, we use little tea balls, tea infusers, like you would use if you were making a nice pot of tea. Um, on one side, we put 10 amphipods in a tea ball, and in the other side, we didn't put any amphipods in the tea ball. And then we put one single little amphipod right here in the middle, and sometimes that amphipod had no visible parasites and sometimes it had a visible parasite. So the nice thing about this parasite is it's kind of like a little red flag that says, hey, I'm a parasitized amphipod, I have this big orange spot on my back. Um, we did that research and first we're just gonna talk about what happens with the unparasitized amphipods. So it's one thing to know that there's safety in numbers, but we also need to know, do they care about safety in numbers? So we, took amphipods, put them in the container. Here the scale from the zero line, as you go more positive, means they're staying on the side of the aquarium where the group was. And as you go more negative, means they're staying on the side away from where the group was. If you were right at zero, it means you're pretty much staying in that neutral zone between the two most of the time. Um, we ran these trials twice. One time we ran them with just regular stream water. 
And then the other times that we ran them, we put water from an aquarium where there had been a lot of fish swimming into the tank. So we didn't put the fish in, but we put chemical cues that there had been fish around in. And we know from other research that amphipods can respond to those cues and they change their behavior if they perceive them. So here, um, we put them in without the fish cues and they tended, it was kind of about a 30% probability that they were staying on the side closer to the group. When we put the chemical cues associated with fish in, that number inched up a little bit. So red or blue, are you convinced that there's a meaningful difference between those two values? Kind of, sort of, maybe, but not necessarily. Um, which is another key part of, of doing research, is thinking about the evidence that you have and how likely you are to, how likely it is that that evidence represents a real difference or not. Statistically, there is a real difference between these two sets of data. Um, it's not a super strong difference, but it sounds like amphipods tend to hang out with a group. And when there's a higher risk of predation, they might be a little bit more likely to hang out from, with the group. Okay. If we look at parasitized amphipods instead, their bars are down below the line, which means they tended to hang out on the side away from the group. Now, if you're just comparing those two bars, when there were predator cues and when there weren't predator cues, are you convinced that there's a meaningful difference between those? Yeah, most people are saying not necessarily so much. Um, but when we look at the two sets of data together and see how non-parasitized amphipods act compared to how parasitized amphipods act, what do you think? Difference, no difference. Yeah. So there's a pretty substantial difference between what's going on there, which brings us to another musical interview. Now Patsy Klein has something to say about amphipods. Crazy, I'm crazy for feeling so lonely. Crazy, my group's hanging out over there. This orange spot on my back is causing me trouble. I stick out and surely all those fish will care. talking about ways that you would protect yourself from predators, a lot of you mentioned the idea of hiding. And other researchers have looked at that pretty extensively too. Some other things that these parasites are known to do to the amphipods, one of them is most amphipods are afraid of light. So they, they move away from light um, rather than toward it. But parasitized amphipods tend to move toward light rather than away. If you are hanging out down on the bottom of the stream, that's probably because you're going away from the light. But if you're attracted to the light, then you're gonna hang out up at the top of the, of the water. And that's a place where a lot more predators are likely to be able to find you. Um, they also, amphipods like to be in contact with a surface unless they're parasitized, and then they don't like to be in contact with the surface. So again, out floating around where they're likely to get eaten up. Um, so there's all sorts of ways in which these parasites are manipulating the behavior of the amphipods. And we're just starting to look at how they're doing that. Um, a lot of the research that's, that's going on is pointing toward the hormone called serotonin which you might be familiar with as the feel-good hormone or something that, that tends to make you feel happy. Um, 
let's see, I'm trying to figure out, I'm gonna skip. Um, but in parasitized amphipods, they seem to have disrupted levels of serotonin, which might potentially bring us to some connections with people who take um, SSRIs, serotonin selective reuptake inhibitors, um, like Prozac is something that might be going on. So the parasites may be using something along that lines as far as a mechanism of changing the behavior. We also know that um, serotonin is connected with aggregation. And if you've ever watched uh, something like a, seen a picture of locusts and a plague of locusts, when locusts go from behaving individually to behaving in a large group, it's because their serotonin levels change. So maybe it's the serotonin level change that's affecting whether our amphipods are grouping up or not grouping up. Um, so there's a lot more research that leads, that um, goes into the work we're doing, which is kind of one of the main themes in that science is really good at generating more questions. Um, so we're gonna take that opportunity to think about more questions and go back to some of our original ones here. So we've already talked about mind-controlling parasites. Would you like to go to BPA or cannibalism? One of the problems is the lighting in here, and I'm thinking there's more green than blue, but I can't actually tell, so we're gonna go green. Um, and think about parenting, and, and a parenting, maybe. Um, so this picture, it's a little bit hard to see, but is a pregnant amphipod, or a brooding amphipod, an amphipod that's carrying eggs. Um, it's a female, so her head's up here, her tail's down here, and Right in here, it might look a little bit darker gray. If we had better resolution, it would look like individual gray dots. And those are all eggs. So the females carry their eggs in this pouch that's formed basically from some body spines that come out this way. And they'll keep the eggs in there. They'll do varying behaviors in order to help protect those eggs um, and make sure those eggs get plenty of oxygen and all that good stuff. Um, until the babies hatch, they hatch when they're still in the pouch, and then they swim out of the pouch and go off on their own. And once they're out of the pouch, in this species anyway, there's no parental care that happens after that. So we could look at the mom's perspective and how the moms avoid getting eaten by predators, which is kind of an important parental care, or we could look at how moms avoid eating their kids, which is maybe a more important parental care, or we could look at both. So what are you most interested in? I'm thinking probably both. So, okay. So back to the question we asked before, how does any amphipod avoid predators? And you guys had come up with one that I didn't come up with, but basically we get into they hide, they group together, or they swim away. Um, do they taste bad? I don't think anybody has really looked at it. So they might. And there are certainly some amphipods that have spines on them, and that would be kind of connected to the taste bed, but our amphipods don't. So I don't know how they taste. Um, I have had students that have suggested we try them as like the equivalent of bacon bits. Uh, I'm not up for it yet. But um, so hiding, swimming, or grouping together, or swimming away are some of the things that we've looked at in terms of thinking about how do these females that are carrying big bunches of eggs look compared to any of the other females that are around or the males that are around. Okay. So for hiding, our fancy experiment, and you'll see back to this whole thing about research being low cost when you work with amphipods, is because we use kind of whatever we have available. So we set up that same kind of experiment, only this time we had a little piece of brown paper bag um, that was moored to one end of the aquarium and no similar brown paper bag at the other end. So they could choose to be in the section with the brown paper bag and they could hide under it or they could be away from that. Um, here we didn't have anybody who liked to be away from it, so we don't have that bottom part of the graph. We're only looking at what happens when we go up. Um, and the same kind of experiment, we ran it with no predators, and those are the blue bars, and then we ran it with predators, and those are the brown bars. Um, 
And we looked at pregnant females, and then we looked at females that weren't pregnant, and then we looked at males. And the biggest difference is with the pregnant females, which raises one question that we don't have a good answer to yet, meaning, which is, how come when there aren't predators around, the pregnant females don't like to be undercover as much as the females or the males do? Um, so I don't know that part. But when there are predators potentially around, or when they think there are predators around, their behavior shifts really rapidly. And they go just about yeah, almost more than, um, certainly more than other females, and about as much as males, they're going to be hiding undercover most of the time. So hiding, yes. Grouping together, we had that same little group experiment, only this time the amphipods that we put in the middle were either pregnant females or non-pregnant females or males. And when we look at the results there, um, if there were no predators around, for the most part, all of these guys tended to hang out all over the place. Sometimes in the group side, sometimes in the non-group side, sometimes in the middle, but there really wasn't much difference. When you put the predator cues in, females that were pregnant start to hang out on the side with the group a lot more. Females that aren't pregnant tend to hang out away from the group a lot more, and that's another thing that we had to figure out what might be going on. Males didn't really care. Okay. When we looked at running away, um, this is a student, I have a student working on this right now. She's been working all fall. Um, and what she's been doing is measuring the maximum swimming speed of different kinds of amphipods. And what she's found is the maximum swimming speed of males is a lot higher than the maximum swimming speed of females, and that's a lot higher than these brooding females. So you imagine you got 20 or 30 eggs that you're carrying around, and you're trying to get rid of a predator. It's not going to be through your vast speed that's going to be an effective strategy. Um, we're going to have to come up with some other plan, and so that's where we think that hiding and grouping become a more attractive option to brooding females because they don't really have the running away option. Males are big. Males are so big that we're using stickleback fish as predators, and stickleback fish probably, they can, they can eat and kill a, a, a male, but it's not going to be easy. The little females that aren't brooding are certainly going to be small enough that a predator can eat them, but they're also fast compared to a pregnant female. And so we think that the reason that they look like they tended to avoid the group wasn't so much that they were avoiding the group, it's that they were just swimming faster. And they were swimming all around the tank, and so they weren't spending any amount of time in one spot. Whereas the brooding females moved over to the group side, and then they stayed there. Okay. So they couldn't run away, so they hid, and they stayed with a group in order to decrease their risk of predation. All right, um, so that gives us some answers. We still have more questions. Um, we're still trying to pull out more of those questions, but in the meantime, um, let's think about the question of not cannibalizing your kids. Um, I don't know if you can see the little guy there on the Cheerios saying, Mom, don't eat me. But there's a problem that I had to leave Waukesha and go to Belfast to solve because it turns out that the amphipods in Belfast are really highly cannibalistic. And I'm not sure why that is. It's also where a collaborator of mine works who has studied amphipods for a lot longer than I have, and so it gave me an opportunity to go there and learn from him and develop some more research experience in a neat setting. So, um, so I've already talked a little bit about the parental development. They start out as eggs in the pouch, eventually the little babies, and that's about, you know, that's pretty typical of the size of the babies when they start swimming around on their own. Um, so eating your kids is bad. Oops, did I miss something? Go ahead. This is public service announcement is brought to you by the Northern Irish Amphipod Association. <laughs> Young Anthropod, 
very adaptive. If we went back, can I do this? Okay. If you were not going to eat anything, would you choose the female on the right or the female on the left to be the one to not eat anything? Right. On the right, because she has kids that are right in the area, whereas the one on the left, not so much. <coughs> if she ate some kids right now, they're not hers, and that would not be as bad as if they were hers. Todd, don't eat your kids. <laughs> okay. So they could never eat any kids. They could recognize their kids, if we think about it from the mom's perspective. Um, and they could not eat kids when their kids are likely to be around. If you don't eat any kids ever, one of the problems with that is you give up on a tasty food source. And if you're living in an environment where there's not a ton of food, that might be a really problematic thing. Okay. Recognition would be great. If you were surrounded by a bunch of kids and you could say, oh, I'm not eating Bessie, Tommy, Johnny, or Tim because they're my kids, but I'm going to eat these guys over here because they're not. But that takes a pretty strong level of cognitive processing that may not be something that little tiny amphipods that don't really have anything, well, they have something recognizable as a brain, but it's not much, okay? So we thought, well, what about just avoiding eating offspring when your kids are likely to be around? Is that something that they might do? Okay. Okay. So here, complicated dish graph, um, we looked at males. Now, they may or may not have babies that are around, and we're not really going to know because mating happens, and then the babies are around, and there's a pretty long period of time in between. Um, females that don't have any eggs or any babies or anything in their sac, meaning they might also have kids that are around, but probably not brand new babies. Females that are in the early stages of pregnancy, those ones with the black eggs in their pouch, Females that are in the late stages of pregnancy, the ones that have hatched or almost hatched eggs in their pouch. And then females who have just released babies into the environment. And so we predicted that the ones who had just released babies in the environment would be the ones least likely to eat. And that's pretty much what we saw. There, the orange bar down at the end. Now, females early in pregnancy, we ran these trials where basically we put a an amphipod in a container, we put five babies from some other female into the container with her. For better or worse, no animal rights activists care about amphipods. <laughs> this is not a research project you could do with lions. Okay. So we did. Anyway, um, in every single trial that we ran with early stage females, they ate those babies. 
Even the males, it was only like 85%. But the early stage females, 100% of the trials, they ate the babies that we put them in with. So when we say that the females who just gave birth are a little bit kinder and gentler, it's all relative because still in half the trials, they did eat some of the babies that were there. When they did, oh, they didn't put that graph in. Um, when they did, they didn't eat as many. So we gave them five. The females that had already released their babies might eat one or two, but not all five, whereas the early stage females, they just ate all five. Um, then we looked at females at five different stages of reproduction, from the least developed offspring to the most developed offspring, so brand new eggs to eggs that had already hatched. And again, you can see that the females that have eggs that had already hatched were less likely to eat any babies at all in the trials. And in the trials where they did eat babies, they on average ate like less than one, well, less than about one and a half babies on average, whereas the ones with the early stage babies ate twice as many. Okay. So it does seem like there is this behavioral shift that happens in the females as they get closer and closer to having babies in the environment, they get less and less likely to eat any babies. This is where the presentation got corrupted and my slide went away, but it raises more questions. Do they not eat anything right then? So do they starve for that period of time or do they just not eat babies? We don't know. There are a lot of other things about this behavior that we don't know either, which is why science is great, because it leads to a whole bunch more questions. Um, it is kind of, oops, that's the other slide that was gone. Okay. Um, one of the things we figured out, I can't remember if you have a slide here. Um, I mentioned before that the Wisconsin amphipods are kinder, gentler amphipods that don't eat their babies. Um, the original intent when we were over in Belfast was that we were doing research there and then we were going to come back and do the same project looking at amphipods in the species that we have in Wisconsin. So I had a student who came over to Belfast with me for a little while, learned the techniques. She came back here, she did the research, and Wisconsin amphipods don't eat babies. Wisconsin amphipods don't eat adults either. If you go over to Belfast, it's not at all uncommon to, when you're collecting to find a big ball of amphipods, and at the middle of that ball is an adult amphipod that all the rest of them are eating. It's lovely. Yeah. If you come here, I've never seen that in Wisconsin. So there's something different going on, and one of the things Rebecca and I were talking about, some of the interesting aspects of doing science, when you publish science, you publish a lot of these results that you've seen have been things that I've published because we've found these differences. There's not much I can do with the data from Wisconsin. We have the same amount of data from Wisconsin that we have for Belfast, but that data shows that our amphipods don't eat their babies. And that's much less publishable than that amphipods do eat their babies. Okay. So just kind of an interesting relationship about how science is done and what gets communicated. What it means is if somebody wanted to do research and they were interested in cannibalism in Belfast amphipods, they would be able to find my paper and several others talking about that. If they wanted to do research on cannibalism in Wisconsin amph amphipods or Midwestern amphipods, they wouldn't find my paper and so they might still do the same kinds of research. But I've already done it, I just can't publish it because it says that they don't eat their babies. So, um, kind of an interesting situation. So there's lots of things we don't know. Um, I think at this point, since science is good at generating more questions, we can think about um, the variety of questions that might be available. But our short conclusions are, first of all, that amphipods are cool. And from a scientific perspective, they're cool because we can ask and answer lots of pretty detailed questions using minimally complicated situations to be able to ask them. Um, that researchers are curious. My students and I have lots and lots of questions. We never run out of questions to ask and try and figure out the answers to. And that we use evidence from the projects we do to better understand the world and that science is fun, and so we have a good time with that. And with that, we're happy to
field any questions about either the behavior of the amphipods or about some of the ideas that went into the presentation and how we set it up.